This is Ocean Robbins, and in just a few moments, we are going to begin today's Whole Life Action Hour. Today, I'm going to be joined by our special guest, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. We're going to focus on breakthrough solutions for achieving food freedom. We host an action hour every month, typically on the first Saturday of the month. These action hours are projects of Whole Life Club, Food Revolution Network's membership program. Whole Life Club members get premium access to these events, including the chance to submit questions in advance, the chance to engage with others in a powerful community of support, access to the recordings, the transcripts, and follow-up checklists. And if you're not a member yet, you'll find membership details on this page. If you're interested, make sure to stay to the end because after we complete this action hour, I'm gonna tell you more about it and let you in on a special offer to join for a huge discount today. Every month, Whole Life Club has a theme. Throughout that month, we have action checklists and videos and recipes and resources to help participants with that theme. And this month, our theme is food freedom, weight loss, and sustainable habit change. So that's our focus today. In just a moment, I'm gonna be joined by New York Times bestselling author and renowned food freedom expert, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. Throughout the presentation, you can engage with other participants and our staff in the comments at the bottom of the broadcast page. Today, we're gonna to look at how you can optimize your diet and your lifestyle for healthy habits, a healthy life, and food freedom. I want to be very clear, nothing about this event constitutes or in any way replaces the need for medical advice. What we're offering is education and our own best insights. But please use common sense and remember, always consult a proper healthcare professional for any advice pertaining to treatment or response to specific medical conditions or situations. Okay, here we go. Welcome to this Whole Life Action Hour. We're exploring how you can take action to heal your body and your planet with food. I'm Ocean Robbins, co-founder and CEO of Food Revolution Network, best-selling author of 31 Day Food Revolution. And our focus today is breakthrough solutions for achieving food freedom. We're so happy to be joined by my dear friend, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. Let me introduce her now. Susan is an adjunct associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences for the University of Rochester. She's a New York Times bestselling author of Bright Line Eating, and she's an expert in the psychology of eating. Susan is president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss and CEO of Bright Line Eating Solutions, a company dedicated to helping people achieve long-term sustainable weight loss. She and her team are on a mission to help a million people get to goal weight by 2030. Her program uses cutting edge research to explain how the brain blocks weight loss and how you can break free. Every day she teaches people how to undo the damage done by food addiction so that they can live happy, thin and free. Susan, you know how much I love you and how grateful I am for your extraordinary work. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, Ocean, I love you right back. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And speaking to all our participants, we're thrilled to have you with us too. It is so exciting and it's so powerful when we join forces with others on this healthy eating path. Now in this hour, I'm going to ask Susan, some questions that are on a line of questions that were submitted by our Whole Life Club members in advance of this interview. At the end of our time in this action hour, I will introduce you to Whole Life Club. If you're not already a member, I will encourage you to stay with us so you can learn all about it and what could be in it for you. And if you're so eager you can't wait or you're curious but know you have to leave early, there is a button on the broadcast page that lets you learn more about it anytime. Now, throughout this event, please make good use of the comments section on the bottom of the broadcast page. We've got staff on there to moderate. If you hear anything particularly inspiring during this action hour that you want to remember or highlight or broadcast or shout from the rooftops or share with everybody else, I encourage you to share that in the comments area as well so everyone can see it. So jumping right in here, Susan, we have an obesity, I think we could call it an epidemic. Almost 70% of our population in the US is overweight or obese. Right now, more than 100 million Americans are on a diet. Uh, I think that uh, when, when you think about how much motivation we have to look better, how actually obsessed our society is with appearance, 
then it's all the more, uh, there's a lot of pain around this issue because a lot of people don't feel like their body is quite the shape or quite the size that their spirits are, that, that we, you call it a right size body, right? Mm -hmm. And I am curious, when you look at the big picture, you know, what is fueling this enormous gap between what we want, we all want to be happy, thin and free, and the outcome we're generating? Oh, I, I think it can be boiled down to two words, food reward. Um, there's a reward value for the brain, the, the connection between the taste buds and the brain. There's reward value of certain foods. They were basically uh, evolutionarily preferenced by our brains and our taste buds because they're the safest, highest density calorie foods you can eat. Foods really high in sweet content, for example, fruits and so forth were always safe foods to eat. Um, not poisonous, always, you know, a good bet. Um, foods high in fat, foods high in uh, meat, that umami flavor. Um, and then later, uh, it turns out that processing of foods, like creating flour, uh, actually uh, dramatically increases the reward value and salt. And so you combine these things together um, and the reward value of food just flies off the charts and our brains really were no match for the manufactured reward value that's present in our foods now. So we're basically walking around in an environment where um, food is uh, way more available, way more prevalent in way bigger portion sizes than our brains evolved to handle. And um, actually our, our brains really evolved to handle a lot of um, food scarcity, but not uh, food overabundance. And in particular, these fake foods. I mean, basically donuts are the equivalent of pornography to our uh, brains. And we just, you know, they're addictive. And I think for um, the majority of the population, maybe, uh, you know, two thirds uh, food addiction is in play to a significant or to a massive extent. And it's fueling us to eat more than our bodies need, basically. Interesting. You just said maybe two thirds and about two thirds of our population is overweight or obese. Would yeah. you say that that's almost the same two thirds? No. Actually, it's, it's interesting. The correlation there is not as high as you would think. There's plenty of people who are overweight or obese who are not in the highest end of the food addiction susceptibility range. And um, there are plenty of people, at, our research shows 22% who are uh, in slender bodies, right size bodies, um, but are uh, full blown food addicts. So there is a correlation, but it's not, it's not lockstep. So it's not the same two thirds. Right. So what's going on when somebody is, um, you know, food addicted, full blown food addiction, but they're in a slender body? What, oh, why, well, they're using that, tons that? of compensatory mechanisms. So they're exercising a bunch, they're purging, or they're just carefully metering out their food treats, you know, obsessing all day about the one cup of frozen sugar-free frozen yogurt that they're going to allow themselves. And, but they think of nothing else, you know. I that, see. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah. And what about somebody who isn't uh, highly susceptible to food addiction, but is overweight or obese? What might be going yeah. on? So what's going on there is they're just kind of, you know, floating downstream with the general food culture. And they just have a body that just doesn't metabolize calories as readily as, you know, somebody who's floating downstream with the food culture, but, but slender, right? So um, it's really not hard to be overweight or obese these days just by eating, you know, five, 600 more calories a day than you need, which is really pretty easy with the vending machine down the hall at work and the latte in the morning, you know, and the muffin and so forth. It's like you just, just overeating based on the glut of calories, but they're not, they're not crazy about it. They're not obsessed about it. It's not an addiction per se. It's more like a, an unhealthy habit. Yeah. Now, you, you've identified that certain foods are very triggering to food addiction, that, that it's not all foods are the same. And right. you know, obviously, we, we, many of us have been raised to think that calories in and, and calories out is what determines um, you know, our, our weight gain. But for a lot of people, that's not the case. There are certain foods that uh, obviously accumulate more in the belly versus others that give us more muscle mass. And there are also certain foods that actually trigger us to want more foods rather than to feel right. satiated. So what have you learned about how certain foods trick the brain into actually thinking we want to eat more? Totally. Um, sugar and flour seem to be the, the base foundation of food addiction. When you take those out of the equation, other foods that are addictive 
in combination with sugar and flour, or even sometimes on their own, um, and you, you're careful about the quantities in which you eat those foods, those foods can be managed. Sugar and flour seem to be not manageable by people who are highly susceptible to food addiction. So it's kind of like cigarettes. You just, if you're gonna break free, you need to stop smoking altogether. So I recommend people take sugar and flour out of their diets entirely, and then um, work to be careful about their fats um, and you know that umami flavor, which isn't just in meat; it's also in soy sauce and you know soy products and so forth. Um, but those ones can be managed. It's the sugar and flour that that kind of make it lights out. Yeah, um, and I think that sugar is more understood in that way than flour is because yeah. we have cravings for sugary products, and you know we have a culture that glorifies sweets, mm -hmm. rewards kids with candy, celebrates birthdays and anniversaries and weddings with sugary things. Even rewards us for a healthy meal. A lot of it's obvious. Of course, a lot of the sugary things come with flour, whether we're talking about donuts or cakes or cookies or you know, whatever. Um, but how does, how does flour play into that? And specifically, I think you've even said that whole wheat flour yeah. can be triggering. Yeah. So tell us Well, what's interesting that. is um, only about 80% of people from personal experience would agree with what you just said. It's my experience too. Sugar is definitely the, the light up thing for me. But, um, but a, about 20% of people will say, no, I really have never had a sweet tooth, but I will fight you to the death if you try to take away my bread and my pasta, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, there are people who are preferentially wired um, to prefer the flowery, starchy products. Um, you know, there just, there seems to be a drug response with both sugar and flour. It's not about the plant that it comes from, whether it's potato flour or rice flour or almond flour or whole wheat flour or whatever. It seems to be a, a molecular thing that has to do with the surface area of the molecules. So when you refine and purify these, these whole natural, healthy, wonderful plants that are fabulous in their whole real state, but when you refine and purify them down into a, into a powder, um, you exponentially increase the surface area um, of the molecules being exposed to digestive enzymes when you eat them. And then that fructose and glucose slams into the bloodstream really fast. It creates a dopamine surge in the nucleus accumbens. And over time, those dopamine receptors downregulate, which is the substrate of um, addiction of any kind, cocaine addiction, heroin addiction. And I often talk about the similarity between how sugar and flour are processed and how cocaine and heroin are processed. You take the inner essence of these plants and you refine and purify them down into a fine powder and uh, you take a normal healthy substance and you turn it into a drug. So is that for, for a food addict or someone who is struggling with food addiction, is that gonna be true of, like the blender is almost like the enemy at that point or the, the grain mill. Yeah. I mean, is that true of anything, whether, it, whether even if it's not primarily carbs, for example, legumes, when you take a legume flour and make like a legume pasta, for example, yeah. or hummus, is, right. that, is that something that you're gonna find problematic too? Um, legumes uh, seem to be less problematic when you put them in the blender. Um, so I would uh, at that point recommend people experiment for themselves, but like hummus is on the Bright Line Eating Food Plan and I do not hear people having problems with hummus. I hear lots of people having problems with nuts and nut butters. Um, but there are these foods that are kind of borderline, right? And um, for some reason, legumes, when they're, when they're um, processed or refined or whatever, they don't seem to be as problematic. Yeah. You just said nuts and nut butters. That's a, that's a sore spot for, for some people yeah. like me who love nuts and nut butters. Oh, now, totally. Just be clear, there's a lot of medical research showing that nuts and nut butters are associated with positive health outcomes for most people. And oh. even stunningly lower rates of obesity despite the high calorie content. But it sounds like you're saying that for people who are susceptible to food addiction, uh, they can be problematic. Can you tell us more about that? Well, they're on the Bright Line Eating Food Plan. So let me be clear about that. They are okay. on the Bright Line Eating Food Plan. I just had nuts in my breakfast, you know. Uh, so, um, but I cannot tell you how many people I hear break, you know, falling off their, uh, their wagon, so to speak, 
on nuts or nut butter. So I just, you know, there reaches a point with all of this where everybody is called to self-responsibility, right? Like notice what triggers you, notice what works for you. And I say, do what works and do what gives you peace. And there's all kinds of borderline foods like, hey, certain kinds of bread are made without flour, right? They're made with sprouted grains that are, you know, however they're made. And there's all kinds of products like that that are uh, borderline. Nuts and nut butters are, you know, you have to draw lines somewhere. So uh, I yeah. draw them as being on the plan. But uh, I'm often inviting people or people are, are raising their hand and saying, yeah, I got to cut them out. I got to get them out of my house because I can't seem to get from dinner to bedtime without grabbing a few handfuls, you know, and it's food I don't need. I already ate yeah. my dinner, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Probably also how they're seasoned is going to have an effect too. And a lot of nuts are seasoned with sugars and spices, but also salt. And that can also uh, have a different effect, I suppose. Yeah. Some people can handle raw nuts, but not salted nuts, roasted and salted nuts. So you got to yeah. watch that. Um, yep. Totally. Yeah. Got it. Um, you um, are not an advocate of smoothies for, for the Brightline Eating Program. You know, with, when people are dealing with food addiction, obviously there's a lot of rage right now around green smoothies where you can, yeah. you know, get a lot of greens quickly by blending them up and drinking them. Although buyer beware, a lot of the commercial green smoothies are much higher in fruit than you might expect. Even yeah. if they look green, it only takes one leaf of kale and a <laughs> big old blender to make it look green. That doesn't a vegetable. Juice. A vegetable. Um, totally. But but for people who are, say, at home and they really are making green smoothies that are based more around vegetables with maybe a banana or a little apple in there to sweeten it up, you know, that can, that can be a wonderful way to start the day with some lovely nutrients for people who are not susceptible to food addiction. But you're saying that uh, for people who are, it can be a real problem. Can you tell us more? Yeah, it seems to hinder the healing of the, the dopamine downregulation in the nucleus accumbens. So those, those nutrients, oh, there's, there's a lot of nutrients in there. There's also a lot of fructose and glucose hitting the bloodstream really, really fast. Again, because of that blending down in the surface area. Um, there's, you know, there's an issue with fiber um, when it's in its intact form. Um, fiber blunts the rush of everything into the bloodstream, right? But when you take that insoluble fiber, those the sort of lattice network of the twigs, so to speak, at the molecular level, you blend them all up, um, you don't get that sort of same protection um, as your food is being digested. There's also, I don't know if you know this research, Ocean, but there's research on neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which is this really powerful, um, uh, process that you want to protect in your brain. It's the way that new brain cells, new neurons are continuously created in this deep, deep, deep part of the brain. It supports um, memory function, protection against Alzheimer's and all dementias. It also supports serotonin production and the regulation of mood and staving off depression. Um, and drinking your calories without masticating heavily first lowers neurogenesis in the hippocampus. It slows it down. It's, it's, it's like saturated fat that way, and it's like eating sugar that way. It, it looks like the brain thinks of it as an unhealthy thing to do, to drink your calories. The brain wants you to be chewing your food. Yeah, fascinating. You're talking about the brain, and you focus on what you call rewiring the brain, mm -hmm. where we literally create new neural pathways so that's yeah. the established grooves that pull us towards loving foods that don't love us back, towards being on the wrong end of an empty bag of cookies all too often, <laughs> towards feeling like we're not really the authors of our own food lives. We get rewired so that you actually learn to love foods that do love you back, so that you learn to have a healthy sense of food freedom so you can really choose what you want, how much to eat, what to eat, when to eat it, rather than feeling overwhelmed by compulsions and addictions. Um, Susan, how long does it take to rewire the brain and can it ever happen completely? Or does it, like with an alcoholic, an AA, it's like once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, you always have to hold yourself in a certain regard. Or can you really um, eventually kind of feel normal, if you will, if you've been struggling with these issues? Yeah. Okay. So those are two very, very good questions and super important ones. So how long does it take? We don't have hard data on this from uh, like a uh, brain imaging perspective. No fMRI studies have been done on this. I really want to do the study, but it hasn't been done. Um, 
But clinically speaking, we can tell because people's cravings start to dissipate, right? And in the Bright Line Eating Bootcamp, for example, um, upwards of like 80 to 90% of people are reporting little to no cravings at all after the eight week Bright Line Eating Bootcamp. Um, yeah. Something like three to 5% of people still are having very high levels of cravings completely untouched eight weeks later. Um, so um, similar to like, for example, if one said, when you change your diet, how long does it take uh, if you have diabetes, type two diabetes for insulin sensitivity to come back? And the answer is, well, it really varies. It depends on how much damage has been done and how fast your body responds. Um, so some people's insulin sensitivity comes back really fast and they're getting off, you know, all their diabetes medication in four to six weeks. And for other people, four to six months later, they still can't, you know, eat a bowl of blueberries without their blood sugar spiking out of control, right? So people are really different in that way. Um, but like I said, we have data that, you know, eight weeks later, 80 to 90% of people are showing no sign from a clinical perspective of dopamine downregulation anymore. Um, the other question of like, can the brain heal entirely? Um, it's, a, it's a really nuanced uh, mixed bag of an answer ocean because um, when we talk about healing the nucleus accumbens, that can heal completely. However, um, upon reintroducing those old foods, uh, it does seem that the downregulation happens again really, really fast. So you can heal in the sense that you can go through your life without debilitating cravings anymore, but you can't heal in the sense that now you can have some cookies and sort of get away with it, unfortunately. In terms of the habit pathways of eating the right foods and sort of living your life as someone who is, like you said, maintaining authorship over their food life um, and not finding themselves all the time eating in ways that they wish they weren't eating, right? Yeah. Um, that involves building new fiber tracks in the brain and repeating them until they're deepened, like riverbeds grooved in the brain. The more the water flows, the deeper the riverbed gets, right? But there's always these dry riverbeds left over from the way you used to eat. And yeah. what's unfortunately the case is the once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic thing does seem to be in effect. Those old dry riverbeds do take over shockingly quickly when you return it all to old behaviors. So what happens is, the more susceptible you are to food addiction, the more vigilant you need to be forever and ever to practice and maintain a new way of life. And the brighter those lines need to be between the way you used to eat and the way you eat now. And although you can feel like you're low on the susceptibility scale and not addicted anymore because you're free of cravings and you feel complete authorship and alignment with your food life and food freedom, um, that feeling only sticks around so long as you keep doing what's working. And the minute you go back to the old ways, it all crumbles very fast. And then unfortunately it's very, very hard to get back. So yeah, it's a mixed yeah. bag. Got it. Well, um, it, it, that, that makes sense. Um, that, and it's, it's, it seems like the more solid you get, on a healthy eating pathway, the easier it is to stick with it. But what you're saying is that if you slip and go into old habits, if you're highly susceptible to food addiction, you are more likely to get lost there. Um, and so it requires constant vigilance, but the good news is that when you are constantly vigilant, it gets easier and easier to be vigilant yes. and it can become a new normal for you and it doesn't take a lot of effort or willpower eventually, but it yes. does take consistency. Yes, exactly. Right. When you say it doesn't yeah. take a lot of effort, it's sort of like, well, like it doesn't take effort to keep your house clean. Once you've tidied it and cleaned it, a little bit of maintenance goes a long way, but that is effort, right? Like it's a thing. You got to keep yeah. doing it. <laughs> and if you don't have a vacuum or a broom, it's a lot of effort. But once you have a vacuum and a broom and you know how to use them, <laughs> then it gets easier yeah. and it becomes yeah. routine. If you regularly clean your house every Sunday, then before long, you don't have to worry about it so much, but you do still have to do it. <laughs> exactly. It's perfect analogy. Yeah. Yep. Right. Cool. Um, some people may be wondering, um, are you susceptible to food addiction? And uh, how do you measure that? And I know that um, we have, um, Susan has put together a quiz where you can find out with four simple questions. If you go to foodrevolution.org forward slash food quiz, 
Again, that's foodrevolution.org forward slash food quiz. You can find out, uh, take her simple quiz and find out how you score on this. And you get a number. I think it's a number or you get a rating. It's From one you know, to ten. Yeah. One to ten, yeah, right. And I'm like a two, maybe. So, you know, I can I can get me started on a bag of cookies, you know, when I'm really tired and I may eat an, all, a whole half of it. But, you know, like, it's not hard for me to not eat desserts or sweets or whatever, you know. But, you know, Susan, I think you're like a ten, right? So yeah. you're- You call me a ten plus, plus, plus. Like, I'm- Yeah. So I'm, a, you, I'm a 48 on that quiz. Yeah. Okay. So you know, you know what you're talking about here from a lot of, lot of personal experience. Um, and everybody watching, you're somewhere on that scale. And so is, so is everyone in your life. And understanding this lens is very helpful because we're not all the same. And, um, and for people who are highly susceptible, they need to be much more precise in their bright lines. Other people can be a little more relaxed. We are all capable of getting pulled in bad directions and eating unhealthy foods in a toxic food culture. And probably to most of us, donuts taste kind of good. But some people have cravings, other people do not. Understanding that is critically important. Um, Susan, uh, for those of us who may have friends who are high on the susceptibility scale, and perhaps we're not quite as high, uh, and some of our participants may be in this boat, uh, and maybe we worry about them. Maybe we want to support them. Maybe we want to introduce them to your quiz or your work or other resources. Uh, but it can be touchy. You know, people don't like have ideolo having ideologies shoved down their throat. And quite frankly, anyone who is overweight or obese has probably received way more than their fair share of judgment, criticism, blame, and feels some guilt and some shame. And it's, it's painful. There's a lot of pain around this. How do we lovingly and consciously and respectfully support our loved ones who may struggle with some of these issues? That's such an important question, Ocean. I, I do agree that it's touchy. And I am, even though I'm, I'm a pretty um, bold gal in general, I'm more, of, more a proponent of um, not bringing it up unless they do, on average. Um, I've heard your suggestion to give someone a book and someone could give the copy of, you know, a copy of Bright Line Eating, um, if you've read it already yourself. And if there's a page on there that legitimately reminds you of your friend in some way that you think wouldn't be offensive to them, that's not like this reminded me of you because it's about people having weight problems and you have a weight problem and I think you should do something about it because I'm afraid you'll have a heart attack. You might be afraid that they're going to have a heart attack, but really I think that's on them to decide to take action about but you could, you know, Ocean's suggestion of put a sticky note, you know, on the front of the book and say, you know, I thought of you on page 42 or whatever. Um, that's, a, that's a sweet one. If you can find a page that, that is honestly something that reminds you of them in a way that's not offensive. But in general, I say um, the best we can do for the people around us is to eat well ourselves and to model healthy eating. Um, to normalize it, you know, um, to have a suite of restaurants that you like to go to that are healthy that, um, you know, other people love to eat into and, um, you know, share them with the people you love. But in general, I sort of, um, I think you can get educated about the ways that your friend or loved one's brain works differently than yours and what they're really dealing with, because it's far more than what well, like Ocean, you, you can speak a little bit. What did you used to think before you met me and before you learned about Bright Line Eating? What did you used to think about people who are overweight or struggling with their weight, right? Just I mean, that I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but I thought that people who were overweight were kind of gluttonous and didn't, uh, didn't have an interest in self-control and were... Um, I mean, I had some compassion that they didn't know better, maybe. I thought that if they just knew that the standard American diet was bad for them, they would make changes. And I thought maybe they were essentially duped into thinking that, that what we see all around us was normal and therefore it was okay. But uh, so I had maybe compassion in that. And sometimes I had judgment and thought, oh, this person is not not doesn't have enough willpower to take care of themselves i thought it was a lack of self-respect maybe or self-care or something like that and you know i feel shame honestly that i carried that and i'm not saying that isn't the case maybe for some people sometimes but i think that a lot of people have enormous 
pain and suffering around this issue and um, you know, don't know how to break free. Um, yeah. And so you know, your work exposed me to the reality that for a lot of people, just knowing what's healthy and what's not isn't good enough. It's not about knowing what to do, it's about doing what we know. And a lot of us don't know how to do that not just because we live in a toxic food culture, but also because of these mechanisms, mechanisms of addiction and cravings. And, you know, we all know we've got gravity. You can jump, you can run, you can dance, but you're going to end up on the ground, you know? Right. And similarly, uh, when you are having a constant pull subconsciously, that your brain is constantly pulling you towards certain ways of eating and certain kinds of eating, then no matter how fiercely you fight, you're going to end up back in those ruts. And, uh, you know, your work has really shown me that um, if, uh, when you, unless you understand how to truly create new pathways in the brain, which includes cutting off the old pathways in some cases very, very sharply, you know, then, uh, then the water is going to keep flowing in those grooves. And, yeah. um, but you can make new grooves and, you know, the best time to fix a roof is when it's sunny out. The best time to build new habits isn't when you're on the you know, uh, in the throes of massive addictive compulsions, the best time to do it is, you know, when you're thinking fresh and clear and you want to create the systems that set you up for success. So let's, let's talk about that for a second, Susan. What are the cornerstones that you think can help people get happy, thin, and free? Um, well, the first thing is to know what to do with your food. Um, and that can be tricky because um, you have to eat. So food isn't like alcohol or cigarettes that you can quit entirely. And um, food can be a slippery slope. There's a lot of sort of borderline things and we can slide down the pathway, sort of the slide down the slippery slope and be back to our old habits. So, um, you know, a very, very clear food plan is important. Um, I don't recommend counting calories or, or really uh, focusing on macros or anything like that. I really recommend a, a food plan that's made out of categories and quantities of food. So categories like vegetables would be a category. And then a quantity would be like 14 ounces for dinner, which is what you get on the Brightline Eating Food Plan uh, for dinner in terms of vegetables. And, and, and then when you go to a restaurant or whatever, you're just looking on the menu for like, where's the vegetables? That's what your brain is thinking, which is a very helpful thought for your brain to have. You know, where's good clean vegetables that I can eat on this menu? The other categories of things to focus on are actions and support. Um, actions being um, things like meditation, um, having a very clear morning routine and evening routine, some system of tracking and monitoring your behavior. Um, I really recommend writing down what you're going to eat the night before. And then the next day, your job is just to eat only in exactly that. Um, and, and a system of support, you know, ideally of people who are like you um, and who have solved the problem themselves. So those are the best people to get support from. Um, but it's really important because food is such a social thing, right? It's really important to be in a community of people who normalize the way you eat because odds are your friends and family and coworkers may not. Um, that's the challenge of getting healthy is that, you know, everyone makes that decision for themselves and you're, you're left living among people who may not have taken the plunge like you are. So um, we're, we're herd animals, human beings are, and we won't keep doing things long term that feel like they threaten our, our primary group memberships, right? So it's very important to develop um, and nurture relationships with people who eat um, well, like we want to eat, um, so that we have as much social glue um, in that camp as we do in the sort of we eat whatever standard American diet kind of camp. Or it doesn't have to be all the way standard American diet to still be not quite supportive. But yeah. food actions and support are the three categories I recommend people focus on. Got it. Thank you. Um, let's talk about that support and that social side for a second. Um, a lot of people have family that don't eat quite the way they do. Um, or friends that don't eat quite the way they do. I would reckon to say everybody watching right now, that's probably true for you. So, um, yeah. so how do you get on a healthy eating path when you are surrounded by temptations and influences that may not align with that? At the extreme, you may have family members who are literally saying, oh, come on, get off your high horse and have some fun. Uh, or you may have people who are just eating their way. They may respect your choices, but they're not adopting them, which means that you've got the cookies and the whatever your addictions are right around you in some cases, right? So Susan, how does someone ad address that? How do we not be antisocial, still have a social life and positive connection with other people, 
but also adhere to our values and our bright lines if we choose to adopt them? Um, that's a great question. And there's so much nuance to it, right? Everything from, you know, if you live with other folks, whether they're roommates or, you know, spouse, children, parents, whoever, um, and they don't eat like you, um, having a conversation around like, um, you know, carving out some cupboard space, some fridge space, you know, asking them as a favor explicitly if they're going to have, you know, uh, snack foods around um, to keep them in a particular cupboard that can be closed in a way that you don't see or, you know, just just cordoning off a, a refrigerator shelf for yourself for your food so that you have a place to put your food um, everything from that to really working on like what you say at social events. Um, often we feel like that social spotlight is on us more than it really is. You know, um, generally speaking, people who don't have food issues don't care what we eat. Um, but there are people with food issues who do care. There are such things as very, very, very pushy aunts, you know, who baked particular things for us thinking that they were perfect because they're gluten free. Of course, they're loaded with whatever sugar or whatever. And it's like, no, nah, I don't eat that still. Right. And so working on what you say and how you uh, it's a it's this little ninja shift of like focusing on the connection and the love. Yeah. While not um, succumbing to eating the food. Right. right. And so right. um I think often in our society, you know, our society is heavy on junky food and it's, uh, it's light on genuine connection, right? Yeah. There's this, I, I'm picturing like rooms of people, uh, you know, gobbling up massive quantities of food together and, you know, some light chit chat going back and forth, some ribbing here and there, you know, busting balls and doing this stuff. But like, where was the actual real connection, right? It, it actually can work if you forego the gobbling of the unhealthy food together, but you really focus on the eye contact and the laughter yeah. and the hand yeah. on the shoulder, it can work. It, there's yeah. a lot to it though, it's a thing. I, I don't wanna say it's easy or it's not a thing because focusing on how you eat differently from people while staying in relationship with them is a thing. It is, and um, I, I had some time with my 18 year old twin sons a couple of days ago and mm -hmm we were talking about what we were going to do together and we were kind of arguing about whether we were going to, you know, go rock climb to the rock climbing gym or go to a movie or go out for lunch or what, what the plan was going to be. And, um, the, the interesting thing was there was this moment when I said, you know what guys, what matters most to me is that we're together and that we have fun together and that we love each other. And what we do isn't nearly as important to me is that we're doing it together. And, I just felt that place where we can obsess over kind of the outside, what we eat or what we do and forget that it's about the relationships. It's about the love and the connection between people that, that, that really drives us. You know, we weren't spending time together so we could do those activities. We were spending time together so we could connect and be together and share that love. And, and you know, at the end of the day, that's what matters. And I think that sometimes food almost becomes a replacement for love in a lot of relationships. Uh, that's why emotional eating can compel us to eat when we're feeling lonely, when we're feeling sad, when we're feeling disconnected. And sharing food together can be a source of connection between people, but let's remember it is the people that we're wanting to connect with, not the food. And the food becomes a doorway if we can use it as such towards sharing time together. It's a thing to do, but the people are really what it's about. And when we remember that core outcome that we want to connect with people if we do then it can help us a lot to let the food not become the focus it becomes the sideshow eye contact sharing from the heart opening taking a moment to say grace these things can all build real relationship and be so much more satisfying at the end of the day than a bunch of calories pouring down the hatch um susan Jumping topics for a second, we had some questions about food swaps for people who are wanting to go on a whole foods plant-based diet and adopt the Brightline Eating Program. What are some replacements for some of the common triggering foods for folks who are wanting to get away from them? Well, the Brightline Eating Plan is really whole food plant-based friendly. I mean, I even, you know, we, we, we consider protein a category in Brightline Eating. I know that nutritionally speaking, that's not necessary. Um, but it turns out that for healing the brain, it is helpful to make sure that you're conscious to get what we would call a protein serving at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But um, I separate out 
the protein tables. So you don't even have to look at the meat and dairy if you don't want to. It's a whole separate plant-based table. And so it's about beans and legumes and nuts and seeds and tofu and tempeh and, you know, hemp milk and, you know, <laughs> all of the different, you know, um, whole food plant-based things would be in that category. So they're really, uh, you don't need to have swaps, really. You just use that table instead of the table that would have the, you know, chicken and the shrimp and the whatever, right? It's a different table. So um, other than that, all of the categories are um, plant foods, right? It's all vegetables, it's all grains, it's all fruits. Um, and then one other swap, so to speak, it's just, again, picking certain items from a table as opposed to other ones. But in the fat category, I know some whole food plant-based people really prefer to avoid oil. And so then the, the swap, so to speak, would be, well, look just further down the fat table and pick the olives and the avocado and the nuts and the seeds. Those are all uh, whole foods that are in the fat category as well. Uh, yeah. It's really easy to be nutritarian or other forms of whole food plant-based, you know, any form of vegan, vegetarian, uh, and do bright line eating. We, we kind of roll out the red carpet for that. It's super easy. Yeah, I think um, the, the question was also about standard American diet versus healthier food swap. So like, what's a replacement for a sandwich when people are going out on the road, especially tips for traveling? What are some of the most triggering foods you see? And what are some healthier alternatives that would, that would work with the bright line eating kind of approach? Got it, got it, got it, got it. So yeah. There is a way that in Bright Line Eating, I, um, I encourage people to uh, let go of finding replacements for certain foods. Like I would rather someone not try to replace pasta or bread in their life and just say, let go of those foods. And so if the question then becomes, well, what's a ready to grab and go lunch? I used to make myself a sandwich. What do I do now, right? Uh, then it's like, well, uh, a bag of baby carrots, a bag of nuts, and you know, little tubs of hummus that, I don't know about your grocery store, but my grocery store sells them in little two ounce thingies that are perfect, already weighed and measured. I can grab that, an apple, in a second and run out the door. Um, that's my favorite grab and go lunch is, you know, and I, I often weigh and measure those things in advance. So I've got six ounce baggies of, um, you know, sliced up red pepper, carrots. Um, you know, I like raw broccoli a lot. I'm kind of a raw broccoli fiend. So I'll put those things in a baggie in advance. Um, yeah, so the, there's a, there, you know, if someone really wants to do bright line eating, there's a million ways to rock and roll with the food. Um, but did I answer your question enough, Ocean, or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Thanks. Okay. Um, Christina said, hi, Dr. Thompson. First off, I want to thank you for all the research you've done on eating disorders and for so honestly sharing your life experience with addiction. I was a compulsive overeater from the age of 16 to 30, and I thought I would never be free of the cycle of binge eating. I'm now 49, and I've done a lot of healing since then. I still struggle with overeating, and I feel like it's just an old self-hatred thing I do but I know that it is much more than that. It's interesting because just writing this out, I'm surprised at how much emotion it's bringing up. In my mind, I feel that it is just something I will always have to deal with, but I know that I must get the help I need to face this addiction. How can I stop the pattern of binge eating? That's such a big question, and I know that I should just take your course to truly heal. <laughs> Obviously, we're addressing that a lot, but anything you would say specifically to Christina? Sure, yeah, I mean, Christina, it sounds like you know, you know what I mean, deep down. There's this sweet phrase, which is come all the way in and sit all the way down. You know, you've done so much healing already, which um, sets you up beautifully to finally sort of put the plug in the jug, draw those bright lines and, and get free. Um, you sound like you're ready to get free. So um, I don't think you need any advice, sweetheart. I think your insides are telling you what you need to do. Thank you. Um, Robin said, I've had breast cancer. I did experience emotional eating due to unthinkable and unspeakable bad services from agencies, which also caused me to have out of balance emotions. Today I'm so much better. I would like to know when sometimes um, people um, ex exhibit strange behaviors that cause me emotional upset. 
which is the best food to eat at that moment to avoid emotional eating and to feel calm and peaceful with a joyful and sustainable healthy habit. So I guess she's really saying that sometimes she is triggered into emotional eating by disturbing experiences. And um, what are some foods she could turn to at times like that that, that would be comforting rather than um, putting her on a bad cycle? Yeah, totally. Well, first of all, Robin, I'm so sorry to hear about what you've been through um, with your cancer and then your treatment for cancer and uh, the emotions that have come up as the result of the way you were treated. Um, I would like to invite you, Robin, to do some journaling work maybe or some meditation work around comfort, around that issue of true comfort. Because I think that eating and food is a very um, weak sort of third or fourth class citizen in the, in the arsenal of like real comfort. I can think of so many things that are more comforting to me than eating. And I'd be curious, and that's, you know, that's because I've done a lot of work over, you know, the whatever it is now, 15, 16 years that I've been doing Brightline Eating, um, you know, working on not turning to food in those types of circumstances. It's a, it's, it's a lot of programming that a lot of us have from our childhood to eat when we need comfort. But I imagine that if you put effort toward it, you will find that there are things that are far more comforting. For me, I'm an extrovert. So a phone call to a really good friend is top on that list or a walk with a good friend if I can find one locally. Um, but uh, journaling, meditating, a bubble bath. I, I have my childhood teddy bear <laughs> um, on my bed mm -hmm. and a snuggle with my teddy bear if it's winter time. I live in the Northeast, you know, a hot water bottle or a heating pad um, and a, a book of Rumi poetry or a cup of herbal tea. For me, the things that I'm describing now evoke true comfort. Sitting with a bowl of food in my lap is more distraction and numbing than comfort for me. So I just invite you to take a look at the notion of comfort. Take another look and see if you can identify some things that are more deeply comforting to you than eating. Yes, thank you for that. Um, Camille said, Susan, thank you so much. I reached goal weight last week after 30 years of hoping I could do so. When I first heard you say to let go of sugar and flour, I was dumbfounded. I never thought I could do it, but I mostly have. I say mostly because I'm imperfect, but I don't eat much anymore. Your science has helped me have peace with food one day at a time. Thank you. I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you. Oh, sweetheart. Well, I want to say thank you. You bless me and congratulations. Like, oof, fist bump, girlfriend. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to finally be in a right size body after working at it your whole life. So one day at a time, easy does it. I'm so grateful to be on this journey with you. Robert said, I'm addicted to Coca-Cola. I can dump anything else. I had a heart scare and I got off Coke for nine months, but after my wife died two months later, I was back on it. It seems strange because I never had a problem quitting tobacco or alcohol. I just quit cold turkey. Any thoughts oh. about Coke addiction? Oh, sweetheart. Well, my heart just breaks for you, losing your wife. Um, yeah. Well, you sound like someone for whom cold turkey has worked. And just because you haven't kicked it yet doesn't mean you're down for the count, right? What's that beautiful old saying? Fall down seven times, get up eight. Um, yeah. You got this. You got this. And I would say, you know, when I, when I talk to people about um, taking the leap to quit something cold turkey, you know you need to. You know you want to. I, I talk about this analogy of, do you know the, the jump rope game, double dutch jump rope, where there's two ropes flying at the same time? Um, if you're about to jump in there, you don't just jump, right? You watch and you wait. And there's an intuitive feel for when you take that leap. What I would say is put yourself on notice to watch. Watch the ropes flying in your own being. Like, when is it time to act? And the moment you feel that tap on the shoulder from the universe of like, now, do it and take action to get yourself support and don't look back. 
Yeah. Thank you. Um, and one other tip, by the way, specifically for people who struggle with soft drinks. Um, I know, Susan, you do this and I do as well. We have a soda stream carbonator and we take filtered water and we carbonate it and we drink a lot of sparkling water around our house. And somehow for me, it hits a different spot than plain water. Now, I like plain water too and we should drink lots of that. Um, but sparkling water is fundamentally kind of the same biochemically, but it does something, the sparkle, that just kind of makes it feel special and makes me more excited about drinking it, particularly maybe with a little squeeze of lemon juice or lime juice in there. Um, and, uh, or you can just do it straight or, you know, whatever. But um, that's just something to consider. And it, it's not obviously the same as Coke. It's not going to trigger the same reward uh, dopamine response in the brain with all the sugar, but uh, it could be a pleasant experience that helps kind of wean you off and it's not making you sick. Yeah, here, here, great suggestion, Ocean. And the, the squeezer, lemon or lime, those are completely bright line friendly. I am, I'm a big fan of that. That's great, some great advice you just got right there. Um, we heard from Ardith who said, I know I'm not alone with sugar addiction. I use willpower to control it, but during stress can at times revert to eating sugar. Any suggestions would be helpful. I know we've already touched on that, but anything more specifically you'd add for Ardith? Yeah, um, it's, it's really uh, an integrated system that gets you out of the sort of juggernaut of eating sugar to cope with stress. It's not one thing. So um, yeah, you might want to, you know, dive in a little bit to the Brightline eating materials and see if you can, if you can put together supports for yourself that will kind of together remove that problem. Um, Tara asked a question that um, I want to put in a little bit of context. Her, her core question is, why is Brightline eating not optimized for health? And I think what she's pointing to is that your focus is singularly and squarely on food addiction and helping people break free from that. And then it's, I don't want to say agnostic, but it's spacious around how people get there. But at the same time, for those people like Tara who are wanting to focus on a nutrient-dense, whole foods, plant-based diet, the presence of things as acceptable in the program that maybe don't conform to that was disturbing. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the strategic choice you've made around that and how you hold it. Yeah, uh, Tara, you're not alone. Ocean had the same question for me when we were talking about maybe uh, partnering several years ago. He's like, what gives? There's a lot of stuff in your program that I wouldn't recommend people eat. And I'm like, I know, I get it, me too. Um, and, um, you know, I guess my thinking kind of goes like this. Um, we've, we've got an obesity pandemic going on and um, I'm asking people to not eat any sugar ever, not eat any flour ever, to eat three meals a day, to weigh and measure every bite. And it's a big ask. You know, a lot of people are not coming from an awareness of real healthy eating. They're coming from the standard American diet. And that's a lot of hoops for them to jump through. What I find, and I'm really grateful about this, is that once people get through the hoop, which is designed to be as large and wide and spacious as I believe is possible to actually deliver the promise I'm making, which is happy, thin, and free. It's not healthy, it's not free of disease, that's other people's promise. I mean, you know the people, Joel Furman and Michael Greger and John and Ocean Robbins, that's their pr pr promise. And honestly, they do it better. I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not, uh, I don't have a background of you know, absorbing nutrition books. I'm, I'm an addiction specialist and I'm a brain scientist. And so I say, look, you stick with me and I'll, I'll give you the boundaries that are needed to cash in on this promise, to get you free and fully in control of your food destiny. But of course, Tara, you've noticed that every single thing you want to eat is on the Brightline plan, right? Like I'm not, there's no vegetables I'm telling you not to eat. There's no, there's no grains, vegetables, fruits, you know, uh, anything that's, that, that you want to eat that's not on the Brightline plan. So um, once you're sort of through the hoop and, you know, uh, happy, thin and free are on your way at that point, you, there's everything there for you. And, um, I, I am pleased to see how many people start to shift toward more plant-based eating once they start doing bright line eating. Cause we talk about it a lot, you know, around, mm -hmm. around these parts, but it's not a requirement. Yeah. And there is a powerful synergy that happens when you combine food freedom with the food revolution. 
And I'm curious if you could speak to that for a moment. Uh, what's your long game vision for how these missions align and synchronize? Yeah, I think of I think of uh, Bright Line Eating as being nested like a subset of the food revolution. I think what you're doing is bigger, Ocean. Um, and um, but there's this subset of the population that I don't know would be ready for your message because they just couldn't do it yet, right? Like they just are stuck, that their brains are too wired um, in these unhealthy patterns. And without guidance from someone who has a brain like theirs, you know, they're not going to get free. So I get them like over the, over the initial place of like, okay, now you're free to eat, you know, in alignment with your values. And then from the food revolution, they learn about um, nutrition um, and also about the impact of their food choices. And I'm so excited about this. I don't talk about it a lot, except when I partner up with you, um, you know, but for each person that I take and I take them from, you know, eating out of convenience stores and movie theater snack bars and convert them into someone who eats primarily out of the produce section of their grocery store. Um, we just shifted a lot of buying uh, power day in yeah. and day out, year in and year out. And that's the food revolution right there. Like the companies that dictate what's on the supermarket shelves, they're watching what we buy every day. And so my hope is to convert as many people as possible into uh, potentially unknowing, <laughs> unwitting soldiers for the food revolution. <laughs> we'll just think they're losing a bunch of weight, but actually they're, they're having a big impact, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't have time to get to all the wonderful questions that have been coming in right now, but I want to say if you find that you're hungry for more, if you're interested in pulling some of these threads of wisdom into tangible action in your life, if you want to make changes to get sustained results, then in a moment I'm going to tell you more about Whole Life Club and I'm going to invite you to join in this online membership program. And we have a very simple goal in Whole Life Club. We want to help you take intelligent action for lasting positive results. The fact of the matter is that obesity, cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, they don't care a heck of a lot how many action hours you attend, how many books you read, how much you know. They care what you eat and how you live. And at the end of the day, it's your habits that often shape your destiny. So we created Whole Life Club to help you implement and optimize and sustain healthy habits and a healthy lifestyle so you can fight disease, so you can enjoy food freedom, and so you can thrive in your life. So in a few moments, we're going to wrap up this action hour, and I'm going to invite you to stay on for a little bit to hear more about Whole Life Club. Um, Susan, before we do that, anything I haven't asked you that you want to answer, anything you want to share, any, any uh, final wisdom you want to share in this action hour? with our participants? I, <laughs> this was not planned, but I, this might embarrass you, Ocean, but I just want your people to know, do you, do you guys know what a sweet man you're working with here? Ocean Robbins is a cut above. <laughs> like I have been working with him on major projects now since, um, since June of 2015. And we've been through the gauntlet together, like stuff has fallen apart and not gone the, gone the way we intended. And uh, I've watched him under some pretty serious duress and I've watched him act unfailingly with integrity, with kindness, with deep consideration for everyone who is involved in every situation. And um, there's just a certain way you get to know somebody when you go through the ringer together. And I suspect, Ocean, that the people that follow you have a sense, maybe, that their spidey sense tells them that you're pretty amazing. But I just want to say, you're more amazing than that. And so for everyone who's um, following along with the Food Revolution um, Network and what it does, uh, you're just in the best hands you could possibly be in. I say this, and it's, it's gruesome, but it's really true. I would take my beating heart out of my chest and give it to Ocean Robbins for safekeeping. Um, that is how I feel about him. So you, you did not expect me to say that. You probably expected me to say something about someone struggling with food addiction and how there's hope. And that's true too. Um, but that's what I felt like saying. So I said. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. You're, you're kind of making me cry right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, and to all of our participants, um, 
you know what it feels like when you're truly seen, um, when you're truly appreciated by somebody who knows you, who's been through some things with you. And there's nothing like the kind of friendship that gets forged uh, through the tough times to, to build trust in that person. And then we see, when they see you, to see yourself through new eyes through them. Um, and everyone joining us right now, I can't see you, but I feel you. And I want to thank you for your attention, for your courage, because Susan said that you're in good hands with me and with Food Revolution Network. Well, what we want to do with our hands is to help you to actually claim the power that's in your hands um, with an informed voice that helps guide your actions so that you can make the choices that are in your best interests. And I know that's why you're here. And, you know, time is and attention are the most precious resources any of us have. They're worth more than money and they're worth more than any material possession. And you are giving your time and your attention and your heart and your care right now to being with us. And I am so honored. I'm so privileged. I'm so grateful. And I hope that we can use your time and attention in ways that are worthy of who you are and what you want to create for your life. And in that spirit, I want to share an invitation with you you, which is to join us in Whole Life Club, which we created really to help cut through the noise and help give you the sustained support over time to build. We have over three and a half thousand members now in this community. We're just getting going, but it's been incredible. The response so far, people are releasing excess pounds. They're having more pleasure and joy in their food lives. They're having stronger social connection. They're feeling more confidence. They're feeling more clarity. They're eating better. They're reversing diseases. They're not needing medications that they used to need. And it's just going all up and up and up forward from here because we're just getting started. Uh, we want to invite you to join in, in this journey with us and become a part of this community with us. And here's what you get when you join Whole Life Club. You will get recipes, another fabulous five healthy whole foods, plant-based recipes, many of them Brightline eating friendly every single week. You get um, community, a place to share your questions, your challenges, your struggles, your dreams, and to have allies and friends and loved ones who will support you and lift you up questions that you can get answered by our professional team of moderators. You'll also get wisdom. Of course, every month there's another action hour like this one with another brilliant expert and you get the transcripts, the follow-up action checklists. You also get a chance to submit questions in advance so that you can have your voice heard and ask the experts what you want to know and hear them talk about. All of this comes as part of it. Plus, you get a weekly action of the week video from me with another simple step you can take to apply in your life and get results. Every month we've got a theme. We've had themes like heart health, brain health, fighting cancer, food freedom. Every month there's a theme and you can apply the themes that we're focusing on that month to get breakthrough results in your life. So that's what it's all about, breakthrough results for you. And normally the Whole Life Club costs $247 a year or $29 a month, but it's on sale today because we're having an action hour today. Until midnight tonight, you can join in for just $19 a month, or you can jump in for an annual payment of just $147. That's $100 off the regular price. And that's if you jump in from this action hour today. So again, if you want to click to join in, then click the button and you'll get a 60-day total satisfaction money-back guarantee. And you can become part of this journey in this tribe with us immediately. And I just want to say that whether or not you join Whole Life Club, I want to thank you for committing with us to do your part to be a part of the food revolution. Because one step at a time and one bite at a time, we are shifting food culture and we're doing it together. And I am absolutely thrilled to be partnering with you in this journey. And um, Susan, anything you want to say about, especially for the folks on here who may be part of the Brightline Eating community already and who are interested in Whole Life Club and maybe haven't made the step yet to join in, why do you think these might pair together well? Well, I think there's a lot of people who do Brightline Eating in Whole Life Club. So you'll have, um, you'll have friends and fellows there. And I think it's important to have a reliable place to get nutrition information and to see... Um, you know, how your actions um, are a part of the larger community and the larger food revolution that we're creating here. Um, and if you're, uh, if you prefer to eat more on the plant-based tip, I think it's, it's powerful to have community in that regard as well. So I think there's a ton of synergy that happens between Brightline Eating and the food revolution and Whole Life Club. So yeah, I'm a big proponent. 
Fabulous. Thank you. So again, this is a special opportunity to lock in a special discount price that will sustain long term because you get renewed at that same price, not the higher and regular price when you join in today. Um, and I just want to thank you for, again, for your time and your attention. You know, we all know that uh, knowledge without action is weak and, and doesn't go anywhere. And action without knowledge can be reckless. But when you combine action with knowledge, then you get power and you can get results. Um, I used to take martial arts when I was a teenager and there's this concept of being centered. When you're centered, you can absorb pressure and you stand strong. And when you're off center, a little tap can knock you right over. And it's my view that when it comes to food, three times a day, we have the opportunity to bring our lives into integrity, into congruence with our values. And when we do that, there's a centeredness, there is a potency to our lives that has all kinds of ripple effects that don't just affect what you look like or even how, how you fight disease. They affect your ability to be centered and integrous in all your relationships and all your interactions because there is a sense of alignment and congruency that takes root in your life. And that's, that's what I want for you. And I know that's what Susan wants for you. So we thank you so much for joining us in this action hour, joining us in this revolution. And we look forward to working with you for healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for all. Thanks so much for joining us, Susan. Any final words here? Oh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ocean. I love you to bits. And thanks, everyone who joined us. It was really sweet to be with you. So much love. All right. Have a beautiful day. Blessings.